Hello, I'm Sheila Rogers. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why that's funny, but... Um, um, and I have been a broadcast journalist at CBC Radio for approximately 400 years. <laughs> it is a great honor to be with you in this hall this evening and a great honor to be among the speakers whom you're hearing. I would also like to acknowledge the honor of being on the unceded territory of the Algonquin people. This means a lot. I could tell you about connection. I could say, go home and read a book, and thank you, good night. <laughs> However, I still have six minutes. Um, and my topic this evening is personal. To begin, a confession. I am dog crazy. Over the last 25 years, I've had a St. Bernard, I've had a Beagle, a Dachshund Border Terrier Cross, and five Schnauzers, but not at the same time. <laughs> I did have a fabulous female Schnauzer named Poppy. She was my bitch, okay? <laughs> Truly, my associate. And when she died, Friends sent condolences, and here is one of those kind messages. Poppy only ever knew love and only ever expressed it. She only ever knew joy and only ever expressed that. She was a friend, an ally, a warmth on cold nights, an unwavering gaze when things needed sorting out. She learned enough and gave enough and now continues on her marvelous journey of becoming more just as all creatures do, even us. You will feel her in the rain, in the wind, in the bite of snow, in deep and penetrating silence when you stand out on the land. So you might miss her terribly, but you'll never be far away from her. That is what spirit is all about. It never leaves us, ever. My longtime friend, and chosen and adopted brother, Richard Wagamese, wrote that. I never thought I would be applying those words, those large-hearted words, to Richard himself. Richard died about a year and a half ago. And I really struggled with this notion of connecting to spirit and how it never leaves us. I was too embroiled in ag anger and what Richard called the cage of sadness. I festered in it. And then some really strange things started to happen. I would be going through emails and realize, oh my goodness, there's an email from Richard I haven't opened. And then there were phone messages I hadn't heard. The iCloud started downloading old photos of him that I thought had vanished. And then some of the books he'd given me, I would see coffee rings on the cover if they were held in a certain light. And the man loved his coffee. Richard Wagamese, a man and his coffee, a love story. <laughs> and these episodes started to open up a third ear, if you will. Richard seemed to be peering over death's transom. And then I found a draft of a manuscript of what would be his final, final novel, Starlight. I'd never opened it. And what a gift from beyond this story is. Starlight was published last month, and Richard is now moving among us and moving us with his great gift of story. Frank Starlight returns from his previous novel, Medicine Walk, and it's 10 years later, and Frank and his buddy Eugene Roth are working the farm that Starlight has inherited from the person who raised him, not his father, but a man he called the old man. Frank's intense study of nature and his comfort out on the land have made him a keen observer of nature, and he's developing a reputation as a wildlife photographer. Into his serene life enter a couple of strangers, tried and true in novels, Emmy and her daughter, fleeing Emmy's violent ex-boyfriend, a psychopath who is hunting Emmy and her daughter down. Richard's writing is crisp, sparing, and luminous. Starlight contains multitudes. Chapters contain novels. It's a masterpiece. 
You are reading it, and you don't want it to end. And it doesn't, because Richard didn't finish it. The last scene he wrote is a cliffhanger that he would have resolved. In the published book, his editor, Anita Chong, included a scene that is believed to be what Richard would have written had he been able to close Starlight himself, and it's a beaut. I believe Frank Starlight is Richard's alter ego. I feel Richard's humor, his Kreskin-like power of observation, his peace out on the land, his capacity for love, and the way he listened. And there's a section in Starlight about listening. He says to Emmy, imagine there's a point of light between your eyebrows. Focus on that. Push your attention toward it. And when you feel like you're there in that space, start listening to the sounds around you. Don't force it. Stay in that small space and just listen. And so she tries it. And Frank asks Emmy, how did it feel? And she says, it felt like the inside of my head got bigger. He says it did, because, because you let yourself hear deeper. When you push your listening out, you can hear everything. You get connected to what you hear. When you're holding a book and reading the author's words, obviously, this is a connection. And we are listening to their words. Richard understood this in a cellular way. He would say, when, when fan letters came in, it's such a wonderful thing to have the work fit so well in another's spirit. He was a great listener. To borrow a term from the Cree writer who's just been nominated for a Giller, Joshua Whitehead, he, is a fer he was a ferocious listener. He loved music, and now I pick Richard up on my antennae when I listen to people like Thelonious Monk or Little Miss Higgins or Rostropovich playing the Dvorak cello concerto, a piece of music that Richard said changed his life. He said, when I first heard it, I ached. It was the most sublime music I'd ever heard. It made me crave more for myself. His craving more for himself got him off the streets and into journalism, and then books like Indian Horse for Joshua, Runaway Dreams, and finally Starlight. His craving more led to great stories, and you all know the truth about stories. As Thomas King has said, that's all we are, and Richard knew that. Richard said, all that we are is story. From the moment we are born to the time we continue on our spirit journey, we are involved in the creation of the story of our time here. It's what we arrive with, and it's what we leave behind. We're not the things we accumulate. We're not the things we deem important. We are story, all of us. And what comes to matter, then, is the creation of the best possible story we can while we're here. You, me, us, together, all connected. And when we can do that and take the time to share those stories with each other, we get bigger inside and see each other. We recognize our kinship. We change the world one story at a time. Thank you.